Um, welcome, everyone. Should I? I'll just go on to the stage. Um, so we have a full room. Uh, please come forward because nobody's sitting in the front, and we'll bring out uh, our speakers later. So otherwise, it's a waste that nobody's sitting here. So please don't um, don't be shy. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon to this uh, beautiful location, SPY25. Um, my name is Vina, and I'll be moderating to today, hosting. Um, so uh, we are here together on the occasion of a book, which is called uh, the same as the title of this event, Post-Growth Planning Beyond the Market Economy. Um, we have two of its editors today here with me. Uh, and so we'll start with the presentation from uh, Federico. Um, I'll get my paper. Oh, this is the book, first of all. So this is uh, not a book promotion event. I had to say that from the editors. Um, but of course, when you're inspired uh, after the event, you can go to the... Um, to the desk there, there's a QR code uh, and, and you can find a, yeah, that will bring you to a web page to, to buy the book if you'd like it. You cannot, uh, unfortunately, already buy it in the book center over there, which would have been nice, of course. Um, so, right. Um, so, I'll introduce Federico uh, now for, he will help, I have a presentation uh, of about half an hour uh, to tell you a bit about uh, where the book comes from, um, what the idea of post growth is, and how it relates to urban geography or urban planning. Um, so, about Federico, Federico Savini, he's an associate professor in environmental planning, institutions, and politics at the University of Amsterdam. He's currently leading an international research program on degrowth cities and the circular economy. His most recent publications include Post-Growth Planning, Cities Beyond the Market Economy, um, which is the one we are here gathered for today, edited together with Kim von Schoenfeld and Antonio Ferreira. <coughs> Please take the mic, Federico. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, does this work? Okay. So thank you, Vinny. Yes, it's not a book promotion, but I really suggest you to buy the book uh, anyway. Um, and hopefully at the end of my presentation, you will see why it's a good uh, thing. Um, also, a lot of the material in the book is also online in different other forms of publication. So it's just good to look at this topic, I think. So um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, interest uh, lately on the topic of post-growth and degrowth, right? In social media, in politics, at the European level, we see this word coming up very often. Um, there are many words associated to it that are used frequently. Many of these words sound like, you know, consuminderen, krimpen, shrinking, uh, austerity, recession, the Stone Age. <laughs> um, Many of these words show a misunderstanding about the topic, or I would say also a deliberate attempt to ridicule the degrowth idea by maybe mainstream economists or existing power um, actors. So let me start saying one very clear thing. What is degrowth? A definition sounds like this. Degrowth is a planned downscaling of all activities that are environmentally harmful and socially alienating starting from those that are less necessary for the well-being of humans and the environment. However, degrowth is also a planned increase of all activities that regenerate the ecosystem and improve social well-being, starting from the fulfilling of essential needs. And most importantly, this planned downscaling and increase needs to happen in a democratic and equitable way. So this is what degrowth means. Degrowth, in fact, is a project of socio-ecological justice. In a, in, in a nutshell, basically, the proposal is to take from excess wealth, also where the excess environmental impact is generated, and to give where there is not enough to meet essential needs and good standards of living. And most importantly, doing that by regenerating the ecosystem. In fact, this Two aims are very well captured by the famous donut of Kate Roworth that you see here on the right, which shows very clearly that we need to bring back the economy to the ecological, ecological ceiling 
but at the same time also meet the foundation of our economy, the social needs that people have, like housing or good health. Why is the growth important today more than ever? The UN chief, the leader, uh, Antonio Guterres, um, recently said that our current mainstream sustainability tar policies are leading us to a highway to climate hell. I guess he was citing ACDC, which is very good to do, I think, if you create urgency. Um, well, the, the point is the current mainstream policies are not achieving climate targets at the speed and scale necessary to meet the uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, let alone actually even the two. It looks now that we are heading to three to four degrees. If we look at the figures of the results of the current years of sustainability mainstream uh, uh, approaches, we see the results, in fact, are not satisfactory. This image shows uh, the growth of GDP, which is the amount of uh, financial transactions in the global economy. It shows that there is a relative decoupling of the emissions of CO2, that's the green dotted line, so it means that CO2 emissions are in fact growing less quickly than the GDP. That's not an absolute decoupling, of course. But we also see that if we take the overall material demand of our economies, the material footprint, so all the, basically the stuff that we use to make things that we buy and to make our servers, computers, phones, everything, if we look at that, we see that there is no, no flexion, no decrease, uh, and that's growing exactly together with the GDP. And that's why the growth come into the picture. Now, this growth of material footprint and CO2 is not equally distributed. Oxfam already showed that the richest 10% of our society emit 50% of all the emissions, and the bottom 50% actually emit 10% of all the emissions. This is an unequal distribution of the environmental cost of our economy. This image shows, of course, clearly that the difference is mostly pronounced between the global north and the global south, right? Yet, in most recent studies, most recent studies are showing that the inequality in environmental impact is also very high within countries, so within the global north and within the global south. If we take, for example, this study, uh, it shows that in Europe, actually, the top 10% incomes produce five times more CO2 emissions than the bottom 50%. Actually, in Europe, the bottom 50% of the incomes are almost close to the Paris target of two, 2.5 tons of CO2 per year. So the biggest, let's say, impact is located in the top incomes. The same, of course, works for North, North America, but also, interestingly, if we take East Asia, also there we see that the rich, the wealth, are in fact impacting much more than the poor top, uh, the bottom 50%. The Netherlands, here as well, we see inequality raising. 10% of the richest persons in the country owns 60% of the wealth. We also see that the um, but the top 0.001%, according to a study published by the Volkskrant recently, has seen the largest and the fastest increase in their wealth in the last, in the last um, 25 years. Uh, in this image, you see, in fact, that the richest, in fact, social groups have been increasing their wealth the fastest. And with wealth comes environmental destruction. We know it. These are the data. Now, just to be clear, it's not that the rich people uh, eat uh, one million more hamburgers or, or you know, uh, fly more. Yeah, they f do fly more, but maybe not a trillion times more. They, they impact through their investments. And the top three investments are energy and commodities, real estate, of course, and land, and, of course, also art. That's also one of the top three investments for the ultra-wealthy -well um, groups of our society. Now, Cities are crucial to this story. They are the motor of economic growth today. Already in the 80s, uh, cities were hailed, they were celebrated as the engines of growth. Basically, they were considered the places where value and economic success was generated. In the 80s, of course, the, the tools of economic success was real estate, 
and the renewal of the city, the real estate was essential. Later on, for example, in 2008, Edward Glazer comes with another book that says that in cities where the ideas are that, that save the world and generate value are produced, ideas for the IT economy and the smart economy. Of course, I could mention also Richard Florida with the creative class. This was the idea that in cities we create economic growth. The result is that, in fact, the top 600 cities of the world collect almost two-thirds of the global economy, actually, but will collect two-thirds of the global economy by 2025. However, with economic growth, as I explained, comes also environmental uh, uh, demands. So we also know that cities globally cover only 2% of the whole land. However, they cover 75% of all the demand of materials and energy. So it's a big concentration of wealth and environmental resources. However, this picture is going to worsen pretty bad, actually. We know that by 2050, urbanization, because the planet is urbanizing, will demand the double of the raw materials of today and will produce 70% more waste. Now, this is also not equally distributed. The figures are actually pretty interesting. In Africa, there will be an increase of 850% of materials for buildings. 850%. In China, 350%. In Europe, we're talking about 40%. Much less, of course, we are an urbanized continent already, but the, 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 basically the challenges of Africa and China and India are huge. And this leads me also to a bit the, to explain the paradox of economic growth. Now, cities, as I said, have been celebrated as the motor of economic growth, but we must question whether the economic growth in cities has really delivered in terms of well-being of the people living in cities. Let's take the case of housing. We know housing is an essential need, right? We know that it's increasingly unaffordable. We also know, however, that in order to uh, address affordability, our governments are producing more housing. Their strategy is to increase supply. This will make environmental, the environmental weight burden of housing even stronger than what it is now. Sand, by the way, is the most wanted material on earth now, today. Um, however, we know also that housing is getting, it's getting accumulated in the hands of large investors. In this image on the right, you see the top 10 investors of the country. In this case, institutional investors with Festeda being the first. We see, therefore, that on the one end, housing, essential need, is getting appropriated, accumulated, accumulated. On the other, we have to extract more sand to produce more housing, which likely will become accumulated even more. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, like digging a hole in the water, right? The result is uh, that essential functions cannot be found in the city anymore. This is a simulation made by my students that shows that 35% of all the Dutch workforce is essential, consider essential. This includes, by the way, nurses and firefighters. Two thirds of this workforce is made by women, actually. And if we take Amsterdam with the income that they have now, uh, this is a simulation of 239,000 euros uh, of maximum mortgage accessible. They cannot find a house in the city. Well, this is the options on Funda, if you have that income. Um, now, the same scheme happens in, for ex in many other sectors. Let's take aviation, right? One of the most environmentally impactful sectors. We pushed the growth of Schiphol for the last 30 years. Schiphol was supposed to be the economic motor of the country. The result of it, in fact, is that we heavily burned it, the region where Schiphol is located. In this map on the right, you see the environmental impact of Schiphol on the proximity of the area. Uh, the blue dots are the houses being built now in conditions of uh, borderline environmental qualities in terms of noise and pollutions. Um, Schiphol, however, there is more and more research showing that the arguments for economic added value of Schiphol are not well founded. Uh, they look, the destinations are also not carefully considered. We also know that 70% of all flights of these airports are actually connection flights. Basically, there are people coming here and leaving and there is nothing coming back to the region where Schiphol is located. And here is the result. The environmental impact is coming back. 
The same process happens with finance, which is probably the most clear. So since the 80s, we built financial districts in cities. The South Axis was the, you know, the top financial district of the country. We did that because we knew there was a financial economy growing and we wanted to, to tap into that value. CBS, actually the CPB showed already in 2013 that the added value of these territories, these areas, is quite questionable. In the Netherlands, every year there are 4,000 billion euros coming in and 4,000 billion euros coming out in the financial economy. This is a great flow of money of which very little stays in the country, also because we know that taxation on financial dividends is not very high. Yet, we're paying today 4 billion euros to make this neighborhood livable by making the dock down. You know, you follow the story of the dock of the Zaudas, putting the infrastructure down. Why? Because the neighborhood is not livable, because we built it for finance, not for people. <laughs> Now, the city of Amsterdam recently undertook uh, um, a research um, informed by the donut economy framework. It's research called the circular monitor, where they measure the impact of the economy on the well-being of people. This study here shows that between 2012 and 2018, the indicators relating to work and the economy were doing very well. So there were high network participation, employment opportunities were good in the city, uh, long-term employment, uh, unemployment was decreasing. You can find work in Amsterdam. However, if we look at the indicators regarding mental health, loneliness, commuting travel time, inequality, Amsterdam worsened at the same time. We see that the work life improved, but the actual well-being of the people didn't. And these are studies published by the good researchers within the administration of the city. This result is not surprising, actually. Um, we know by now there are studies that show that there is no direct correlation between the increase in GDP of a country and the return in terms of uh, life satisfaction. This image on the left shows, for example, that the United States, the United States which have almost the highest GDP, do compare, do have the same level of life satisfaction of Colombia or Taiwan, actually. We see that there is basically a flattening curve. Studies. Psycho psychological studies ask people, uh, researchers ask people, what makes your life happy and wor worth it to live? And of course, people say health, friends, family. They don't say work uh, or you know a new, a new telephone or things like this. We know that these are the things that make people happy. Um, now, planning has played a contradictory role in addressing these major problems. Planners since the 70s, but even before that, but let's say since the 70s, when we started to, wear, to be aware of the environmental issues, uh, promoted growth. They were actually attracting jobs, more houses, of course, more mobility, all kind of mobilities of different types, more visitors, more tourists, more houses, more of everything in cities. We did that either by sprawling the city or by finding different architecture to make it compact. But this is what, what planner always pursued. On the other hand, they also tried to compensate for the effect of this growth. They did that by you know, smart urbanism, green infrastructures, green washing of buildings, energy transition, so more renewable, more solar panels, circular housing, that's, we'll, I will talk about it in a second. So there was a compensation at the same time. Yet this double role has very, it's become very problematic, I would say. Let's take the case of uh, uh, electrification. So one of the sustainability mainstream policies now in Amsterdam is to electrify everything, right? Uh, uh, electrify cars and basically houses, everything we can. And this uh, is decreasing, in fact, the CO2 emissions within the city of Amsterdam. That's true. However, what, by doing this, we're shifting the cost of this transition in other territories, areas where electronics are produced and where they are dismissed, like waste dumps uh, in Africa. Let me give you a more example. Now, lithium, because of electrification in cities, will become an extremely expensive and rare material. L lithium is what is used to produce the batteries. We know that by 2030, the, the demand will, almost, uh, will increase by almost 
There are studies that show that if the entire surface of a cities in the world would be covered with solar panel, we would just supply 2% of the energy that cities need today. This also means that the space of the solar panels and the mines, by the way, of the lithium will be more scarce. This problem is actually visualized in this image on the left here. This is a, a list of um, different forms of energy per land use, uh, per megawatt hora. So it's, they're listing the, the forms of energies that demand land usage, space, basically, somewhere. Uh, we see that the onshore wind, the wind turbines, are the one who requires the most, 250 square meters. So if you put the turbine, you have to consider at least 250 square meters around it. Yeah, no wonder that wind alarm in the city, in the movement against wind turbines in the city of Amsterdam, is pointing at the fact that these wind turbines will make also part of the city where we live now, having direct Direct, being directly affected by these solar, uh, by these uh, wind turbines. By the way, solar panels are very good if they are put on roofs, but they are put on land. They also require a lot of land use. So my point here is not that renewables are bad. Of course, we need renewables. My, my point here is, is that if we continue assuming that the economy will grow, we will not have space for this renewable energy. And I'm not even talking about the lithium. I'm just talking about land use here. And think about this, the implications of this for a country like the Netherlands, highly urbanized and very dense. So land use, it's also a big issue now, finding place for these renewable energies. Now, these contradictions of planning are becoming more clear by the day. In fact, just a few months ago, two months ago, 800 uh, uh, city employees signed a, a letter, a protest letter, to their government saying, look, the way you want us to get to the climate targets that you post, it's impossible, it's too hard, we can't do it this way. There is basically a contradiction between the climate target and the approach that we're using to meet these targets. Other examples of this paradox is eco-gentrification or greenwashing basically is the, the situation in which investments in green infrastructures, biodiversity or you know, uh, trees on, on buildings or uh, nice walking paths, turns into an increase in land value which pushes away the lower incomes. This is also a modality that is it's of greening that is really growth dependent. Basically, you invest only in the areas where there is you know, a return on the investment, high housing prices. These two cases are taken from New York, the High Line, and the other is the very famous case of Milan, um, Bosco Verticale, vertical um, uh, bush, which is basically a high income luxury housing dressed up as a tree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, what is a post-growth approach to planning? How do we solve this contradiction? Well, I don't have a clear answer here, but I hope to give you a few indications. So, first of all, a post-growth planning is one where cities and planners pursue well-being and equality directly and not as a result of economic growth. So, we should let away with the idea that in order to be sustainable and to equal, we need to generate more growth. That's the first step. The second is to downscale and slow down the material demand of cities. So to have an agenda that is clearly targeting the downscaling of the material demand of cities and their footprint. Also an agenda that is clearly geared to increasing the life quality of those that don't meet basic needs by redistributing from there is excess wealth and excess environmental damages. It would be nice to have a nice mapping of where this excess is located in order to redistribute. And finally, to generate an economy that is immaterial or better, that it requires less material and less energy. And that's an economy of health, care, education, culture. This is an economy that is truly sustainable, in fact. It's not an economy of consumption. Now, the city of Amsterdam two years ago already published a, a, an environmental vision, the Omgeving Visi, 2050. In this vision, one of the five strategic choices is Groeien binnen Grenzen, to grow within limits. It's good pronunciation. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this strategic choice means that the city wants more jobs and more houses, but they don't want to expand, of course. That's not good, even though with the debate on the Oftgrundstruktur now, that thing is coming back. But anyway, 
they don't want to expand. Well, the only way to get this target right is to change the economy of the city into one that requires less space and less materials. And that's an economy of healthcare, education, and culture. It's not an economy of international traveling and consumption of useless stuff. Okay, that's pretty clear. That's how you get this target right. Let's take housing. We will discuss more about that today, I think. But how does the post grow agenda for housing looks like? Well, the post grow housing agenda looks like this, I would say, in simple terms. To tax multiple properties, to tackle large investors, to avoid accumulation of housing in the hands of few in order to make it possible for, uh, to meet basic needs. Of course, to invest in high, in high quality, decent living. So this means new designs that allow us to reduce the space per capita while maintaining high quality. There are designers and architects that are working on this right now. Using, of course, circular building designs and low impact uh, form of uh, architecture with a lot of shared facilities. And of course, doing this by increasing social housing, yes, but also forms of housing cooperative of common property that allows, in fact, to generate this decent living, this, this high quality, low impact living. There are cases like this already happening there, um, but these cases are marginalized or getting in trouble, I would to say, because they don't get the support that they need. On the left, you see the housing cooperative, the new made. This housing cooperative that is, in fact, trying to develop a form of living that is low impact because it's highly, it, it depends on a lot of shared facilities and a common property system, is today struggling to get support from the city. On the right image, you see another way to pursue the same goals, which is, in fact, to claim that excessive home ownership is unethical today in a condition where, you know, you can't build infinitely anymore and you need to share as much as possible to redistribute as much as possible existing home ownership. This is a referendum in Berlin of four years ago where the people actually uh, supported the idea of expropriating uh, owners that have more than 3,000 dwellings. You might think it's crazy, but there is a lot of large support for this type of decisions. And as I said, investments in culture, in care, in education, in health, are those investments that require less money, give employment, yes, they do that, they do give jobs, but they're also more sustainable, they're truly green. And I deliberately choose two images that don't have any tree on this. It's not a green colored economy. It's a green because it's sustainable. So you have a cultural space. This is from Naples. It's a common space where uh, that is open to the city and people come together. And the other hand, there are just more spaces where people can just stop, uh, be non-consumeristic and interact. That's essential. This is a, one of the other targets. Finally, we also need to think about the relation between cities and their hinterland. So one of the problems today, in fact, that we living in the city, we have forgotten where our food, our energy and our materials come from. There is no ecological consciousness, consciousness anymore. The farming industry of the Netherlands doesn't supply the Netherlands, only 15%. The rest goes far away. So what we need is to bring back an agroecology within the region and reestablish the linkages between cities and the hinterland. That would not only help to feed us with better food, of course, but will also help us to learn a culture of consciousness, which I think it's essential to achieve the climate targets. So this in ideas, you can find them in this book that uh, was an occasion for me and Kim and Antonio to come together with other 25 people all over the world to reflect about this. In there, you find a nice manifesto, for, which we think summarizes the key points. But also, we talk about dwelling and housing, which I mentioned. We, will talk, we talked about mobility. That's essential uh, for a post-growth debate. But also, we address the issue of governance and regulation. So what type of governing bodies are needed to achieve these goals? The issue of food, of course, and nutrition. And finally, also, we reflected about the education, how we can educate future planners and policymakers to achieve these uh, goals. So thank you for listening, and uh, uh, you, I hope you will enjoy the debate. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Federico, for that um, very intriguing presentation.
Um, so we will continue with the discussion with uh, with some of uh, the panelists or with all the panelists that we invited today. Uh, they are all uh, experts on this topic from different angles, um, and so we're very happy to have them today with us. Um, so first, I would like to invite uh, Kim. Um, Kim. Carlotta von Schoenfeld, she's uh, one of the editors of this book as well. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Transdisciplinary Research, Culture, Space and Memory at the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, um, University of Porto in Portugal. Um, she is, like I said, she's co-editor co of the book uh, and she's the author of several publications on post-growth planning and mobilities as well. Um, so, great you're here as well with us, Kim. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, then we have Cody Hostenbach. He's assistant professor in urban geography at the University of Amsterdam. He has published largely on housing inequality, gentrification and housing injustice in the c cities all over the world. Uh, and he's author of the book Uitgewoond, published in 2022. Uh, where he addresses the politics of the Dutch housing crisis. So very uh, great to have him here as well with us. Thanks for coming, Cody. And then we have uh, Melissa Kutuzis. Uh, she's a housing activist and movement builder that co-organized Het Woon protest uh, and other housing protests in the Netherlands. She works at the Transnational Institute, mainly on transformative cities, which focuses on collectives that are building post-capitalist alternatives and have successfully campaigned for the right to water, food, energy, and housing around the world. Um, thanks for being here as well, Melissa. Um, so, yes, I would like to start before uh, opening it in um, the audience and uh, asking uh, them... Uh, to all their burning questions, I would like to uh, first ask you a question. Um, so please, uh, I would like to allow you to reflect on a presentation of Federico um, and ask you how the post-growth uh, post idea, the post-growth narrative speaks to your work as a researcher, as an activist, um, and why uh, you think it is important to, to give up the illusion of endless accumulation uh, in cities. So please, Kim, first uh, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you, and thanks so much for, for having us and uh, here. We're really excited to discuss this topic as well with you guys, and, and thanks for the question. Um, well, uh, I have a bit of a mixed background, as you could tell from the very long name of the position I currently have in a, a center on uh, culture, space and memory. What is that? Um, everything and nothing you could say, but it's, it's really interesting and uh, it's ex an extremely transdisciplinary research center. And I've been over the past year uh, actually delving into history and culture much more than I ever have. But my background is in human geography and planning mostly. Um, and I uh, really was <laughs> kind of my personal motivation to, to look at this topic of post-growth had a lot to do with how do you really unite social justice and environmental sustainability because in a growth discourse that seems an impossibility somehow um, and it's not. And I think uh, I've always approached different topics throughout my career and throughout my life, really, um, in a way trying to yeah, give an answer to that. How can we uh, you know, unite those, those things? And um, I think degrowth and post-growth um, offer some answers to that, at least some options. And I think Federico really nicely showed us that. So I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yes. Yes. Please go and go ahead. Just yeah. Thanks for this opportunity to uh, congratulate you on your book, both of you actually, and Antonio. Um, now, I think my expertise is in housing politics, and as you see, as the current housing pol uh, politics is organised, for example, in the Netherlands, but in many other countries as well, it's based on the premise of growth. And of course, we need more housing units. That's something Federico has established as well. But the whole system, that the current system can only go on if um, housing prices keep increases and keep increasing. Homeowners can accumulate housing wealth. That's an unsustainable system. It's a socially unsustainable system. I mean, the average homeowner in the Netherlands 
owns 90 times, so nine zero, 90 times as much wealth as the average tenant in the Netherlands. That's completely unsustainable from whatever perspective of sustain sustainability you have. So I think we urgently, urgently need to address the current housing crisis we are in, but not by reinforcing the existing system, not by um, doubling down on the the myth of home ownership being superior to renting, for example, um, not by relying on these big investors that um, want to have good revenues at the cost of livelihoods, but that we need to think of other ways to um, grow our housing stock uh, through practices of, um, of care, for example, and the new remains, which is currently in a limbo, would be an example of this, uh, I believe. Um, so I think... Um, from a perspective of housing and housing politics, we could use a lot more of degrowth thinking. Federico already touched upon it, and then I'll give it uh, to Melissa. But um, there was a recent study from the UK that showed if we are going to build all the houses we need in the UK to, um, to fulfill demand by current standards, already that um, eats up all, our entire carbon budget. So then you couldn't do anything at all anymore. So um, uh, giving, uh, getting enough supply using current day construction techniques uh, and standards and materials whatsoever, it's impossible if you take uh, the climate crisis seriously. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Melissa. Uh, yeah, let's think what I can add to that. Um, I guess for the, and thank you for this opportunity, of course. Um, I guess for when we look at uh, housing also in Netherlands and kind of what it means to organize a housing movement and um, looking at a capitalist society that we live in now, uh, thinking of alternatives to growth is essential, um, Not, but also kind of how we how, like the future of living will have to be different than uh, how we live now. And that is very difficult to, first of all, realize ourselves. I think we're all very much used to a model of consumption and a way of living uh, and all kinds of pri privileges that we have that we don't really, don't really know yet how to transition to a completely different way of life. So that's kind of more the individualistic um, problem. Um, but of course, with, from a housing movement, we're always trying to look um, at those who are in power at the moment um, and kind of the bigger financial system, the financialization of housing, which can only um, exist within a capitalist uh, structure. Um, so in order to have a different way of living and also a different way of building, a different way of consuming, um, a different way of planning, uh, it really mean, means that we have to break with these capitalist structures, right? Uh, at the same time, there's always a tension between um, what, what can we do to build a, a world for the future and how do we deal with um, the existing uh, needs and, you know, unsustainable... Um, just places that are already existing, like do we demolish them, do we renovate them, what do we do with kind of existing buildings? Um, and that is also still very much a, a big question that I'm not sure that um, all cities are dealing with in, a, in the most sustainable way yet, uh, which is also a reason that we, you know, the housing movement um, has to be I guess, b better integrated with the climate movement and have kind of a bit more holistic intersectional thinking about how this different world will, how we can actually build this, this different world together um, in order to survive, you know, as a whole. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for answering that question. Um, so I would like to give the audience uh, the opportunity to get into the discussion, um, to reflect, ask questions uh, about Federico's presentation as well. Um, so please, first, uh, who dares to be first? In the back, we have Rodelieve. She has a burning question, it looks like. Thanks. 
Well, first of all, I'm very happy to be the first to thank uh, the authors and the editors of this book. Uh, I was about to rush out to the, uh, to the name, but uh, <laughs> we still have to wait a few days, I heard. But thanks very much. Uh, what I wanted to know, know from the people who are very closely involved in the book, what, what were the most, let's say, contentious point of discussion that you had amongst yourselves as people compiling this? Because when Melissa was just talking about integration, I feel we're at a time when you know, all kinds of things need to be thought up together collectively with much more integrated schemes. So um, what in your conversation was the, the toughest um, kind of challenges that you see ahead trying to do that? Yeah, I can answer that. We had uh, several meetings and we also <clears throat> divided the book in different subgroups where we could discuss these issues. And the most, um, let's say, uh, fired up discussions were uh, when we talked about uh, two questions. The first was the capitalism question and the second was the state question. So the question is whether uh, degrowth is compatible with the capitalist system was debated. Is degrowth an anti-capitalist project? by, by uh, default, very clear, or not? Or is it a project of a different society that might look like something different that you know, includes some uh, processes of uh, you know, market dynamics and private property and things like this? So that was the first discussion. The second was about the role of the state. And there you see the reflection of the, also the, let's say the debate within the degrowth um, scholarships, which is basically split, I'm putting very simply, between the most uh, anarchist uh, you know, stream of thoughts, anti-state. Um, the other is the most uh, um, state-centered stream of thought. We need regulation caps. We need more nation states capping on, on environmental damaging, damages, allocating resources. So that's the other wing. And we have somehow the in-between wing that is more debating with the commons, thinking in terms of commons within, within forms of state that we know them already. So these were the two topics, let's say. And I think we didn't come to a solution uh, of this debate, but the conclusion I think is that that kind of made everybody agree a bit was the point is not really having a precise image of how the future would look like, not like a communist society or a socialist society as we know it. But the idea is to start, to take out and some sectors of the economy from the grow dependent economy these sectors should be the sectors of basic human needs, housing first, food, clothing, and heat. These are essential, we sh and water, and we should take them out of the economic capitalist system, and then see how the society that works like this would look like, whether it's a, something we could call capitalist with a state or not. The point is to start and to navigate in uncertainty through uh, some sort of strategic goal which is different than a complete image. So I think that's how we came to the conclusion there. Thank you. Um, does it answer your question a bit, Khalil? <laughs> okay, yes. great. Um, please uh, go ahead if you have a question. Yes, over here. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, it seems like thanks to the work of people like you, there are solutions, like we know what the solutions could be. But my question is, and like this is a difficult question, how do we get those solutions to be implemented? And also on an individual level, what can we be doing to help move towards those solutions? Hmm, a question on strategy. <laughs> I can give it to you, Melissa. Uh, yeah, that, that is indeed a very, very hard question. And I, I think um, one of the problems is that the, there's a larger part of the society, at least in the Netherlands, that is doing actually quite well, right? So the home ownership has, um, has increased and their wealth has also increased. Um, so to try to kind of have a more solidarity economy where we're saying, look, you've had your 80s, you know, the sky's the limit, uh, age and that that's gone now and we now need like a, a different way of organizing um, and the political elite is not um, are not very socialist -y type of folks and are very aware that we have these climate goals and you know so within policy you see all these 
um, there is some like movement towards a transition to a more climate proof type of society, but the actual you know the difficult decisions are still kind of not being made and kind of pushed to the future to different to the next generations right so honestly, I think that if we're looking at you know big societal questions like how are we going to make sure that uh, poverty will not increase, how are we going to make sure that you know, we, we don't end up in a huge climate catastrophe. I think it's becoming more and more important for, first of all, for us to organize. So going back to this idea that is not very old, <laughs> it's very old, but it's also still relevant that we have much more power as collective than as individuals, which again has, you know, Netherlands is much more a country of individuals, which has also been promoted by home ownership, right? I have my own ho house. I can, you know, I'm sort of okay, I have a good job. Um, and, you know, if, I, if, if I'm doing well, that automatically means that other people will also be okay because it means that the welfare state doesn't need to help me. So basically just looking, just making sure that I am okay is already almost like, in a neoliberal way of thinking, a socialist, way th with socialist thing to do, you know. I'm buying a house and that's good for all of you. Of course, that's not actually the case. So honestly, I'm thinking more and more of besides organizing, which is already a huge task, which can already, um, you know, kind of create all kinds of um, difficulties, how to reach a consensus among uh, groups of people that perhaps they think differently about solutions. Um, but also, even if we are very much organized, we are still a minority, right? So the, the those who are not doing that well are, will always remain a minority, in, uh, especially in the Netherlands. Um, so because we're a minority, it means that there will never be a majority that will say, okay, your needs are actually important enough for us to change our entire political system. So because of that, I think we should also not be shy uh, to think about you know, the use of organized violence uh, especially when it comes to, you know, the climate crisis. So uh, ways of sabotaging uh, the fuel industry, uh, I think, are at this, it's at this stage very much um, a kind of practical solution for the fact that, uh, you know, politics are just kind of not doing enough, right? And because also um, it's not just the political elite, it's also the higher middle class that are not very much willing to give anything up. And just kind of like the idea of squatting is, you know, there are all these empty buildings. In Amsterdam, we have about 19,000 buildings that are empty. And at the same time, we've, our, you know, homelessness has doubled in the country. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, the state would think that this is a violent thing to do, is to just take these houses and defend them and you know, fight with police whenever they, they come and try to kick you out. Uh, if you're looking at kind of a more just way of making sure that there is, uh, that there's a smaller gap between those who have everything and those who don't have much, uh, I would say it's, it's only logical to start to just do that more and uh, more massively. Uh, I'm, yeah, first of all, I said, yeah, because I think that uh, at, this, at this moment, you need a type of violence to be able to do kind of basic stuff, right? So for, for, so for a lot of people, squatting is a violent thing. It's a thing that is completely illegal, uh, is a reason to put you in prison. Um, but, you know, I would say that it's, it's a, a much b bigger criminal act to leave empty houses when there is, um, you know, such an increase in homelessness. And again, I think we start with a collective organizing, but that's why I'm saying I think we need to think about, you know, the reality of the future. And that also means maybe thinking about 
uh, organizing in violence. And the question is how many people have already died because, you know, because of the system the way, is, is the way it is. So. Thanks. Um, I have a question here. Yes. Hi. Uh, my question is about uh, institutional um, investors in real estate. And I'm wondering about um, how you attribute the environmental impact of investments to uh, the invested money and the investors behind it. Uh, and the investor, like the institutional investors, they have a fiduciary duty to their investors, and those are the pension pensioners. So those are all the people that are having their pension very soon or now in Holland. Um, and on the other hand, is my question is about uh, single occupant homes or homes that are occupied by one person. And uh, it's never been as high as it is now. We live with only one person in a home, like in many homes in Holland. Uh, could be a solution that we change fiscal rules uh, that people are sort of fiscally a bit more forced to live together and mingle a bit more like we used to do uh, to solve part of the housing problem. Thanks. Um, it's a bunch of questions, I guess. I think I'm looking at you, Cody, a bit um, because it relates a lot to housing policy. Yeah, thanks. I think these are two relevant questions, or maybe even more than two relevant questions. Um, now I think when you're looking at um, institutional investors, and indeed many of these institu institutional investors are dealing with our pension funds. Federico Schautograf at Vesteda is our largest investor. They're, in, they're using our pension funds. I think as a state, it's an idea I'm currently developing and thinking about. So if people have suggestions and want to think along, please, um, please do so. Um, I think as a state, we should simply say, by 2030, for example, you're not allowed to invest anymore in expensive rental real estate with our pension funds or in unsustainable homes. But then you also have to um, provide an al alternative, like sustainable social housing with revenues that are maybe not very high, but enough and stable enough as well for pension funds, because pension funds want stability also in the longer term, um, and basically force them to invest, or not force them, but forbid the other thing and make this an attractive alternative to invest in sustainable, affordable social housing. And I think the question is a very legitimate one. You're dealing with other people's pension funds, and if you're asking these people, are you okay with your pension funds being used to build like the Amstel Tower next to Amstel Station, in which you have 40 square, uh, 40 square meters for 1,600 euros. Are you okay with your pension funds being invested in those kind of things or in fossil fuels? Um, I think a lot of people uh, wouldn't be okay with that. So I think that's a very uh, good way as a, as a government to ban this and provide alternatives to it as well, because we also need these pension funds in the future um, if the climate crisis uh, allows us to have a, fan, have, have a pension in the, in the future. That's one. The other aspect of single homes, I do think it's a good idea probably to uh, make it fiscally less attractive to over-occupy space and make it more attractive to um, live in a suitable home. But the crucial thing here is you have to do it across all tenures. You have to do it for both renters, but also and maybe especially for owners. And the real risk at the moment is, is that the government is going to think of a system like this, but only for tenants. And there is already such a huge gap between owners and tenants, also in terms of their rights and the things they can enjoy and can't enjoy. If we're going to impose this only on renters, and I can think, I, I can think this is a real risk, actually, then the gap is only going to grow. And the, the issue of um, over-occupying space, or under-occupying space, I should say, is much bigger in, uh, in home ownership. This is where you find people living in huge villas with one or two people. I would like just to give a few numbers about this. I mean, there is research who showed, asked uh, clearly, what is the decent amount of square meters? Also, decent amount of traveling, decent amount of food and water and heating for meeting climate targets today. The results was that uh, it should be uh, 15 minimum, uh, 15 square meters per person plus 
40 uh, meter per person for shared facilities in a family of four. That would come, would come to about 30 square meters per person. If you take these calculations and then you say whatever is above that gets taxed progressively. So if you have, if you have one household which lives in 300 square meters, that's a, a way excessive underuse of space, then you could progressively organize, modulate taxation for that. By the way, there's also the same research which shows what is the amount of thousands of kilometers per year traveling. And the result was about four to 5,000 kilometers per year. That means if you take one flight to another continent, you're already past your yearly traveling, in fact. That's quite challenging. But still, you, would, you could organize taxation on, on, uh, on, and, subsidy, yeah, and subsidy to transportation, transportation based on these exact figures. The same works for water, by the way. They also calculated that we can fit 40 liters of water per person per day, for example, as a minimum to meet fully, easily climate targets. Can I just answer the, the nuclear? Somebody said, oh, nuclear, right? Um, no, no, it's important. I think nuclear, nuclear is serious to, uh, of course, we can take it into consideration, but we will not build nuclear in the next 15, 20 years. We'll be already underwater by then. And, you know, it's not uh, the viable. Uh, it's not speed and scale enough and finding also the land necessary for the, for the and, the, uh, you know, the facilities for the, for the, for the uh, waste. So I think instead of focusing our attention there or some fantastic carbon capturing systems that get CO2 out of the air, it's l more utopic than actually degrowth. That's my impression. Um, right. Uh, I think the question over there was already uh, raised uh, earlier. Yes. Yes, thank you for all the suggestions you did and, and the whole and the book you made. Um, well, I'm, uh, my English is maybe not so good as, as yours, but anyhow, I try it, and otherwise I, I'll do it in Dutch. Um, I worked for a physical planning agency a long time ago, uh, ago but they abolished uh, abolished uh, the physical planning agency, unfortunately. And I think it was under pressure of political parties, the Liberal Party. And I think we have to look for solutions at the politics. Um, we have to, to uh, stimulate politics to do the right thing. And uh, yeah, how do you do that? This is uh, difficult. We have uh, many crises these days and no one can really uh, solve them uh, soon. But I think, why don't you promote your book, for example, in the papers at Buitenhof? Buitenhof is a program that is very much... Uh, the, the politics are, are really looking at these, at these programs. And, and try that, and try to, to um, stimulate that and, and give the suggestions. I think that's maybe a better solution than uh, revolution. <laughs> Right. Um, so on the matter of if we can leave the solution to this crisis in the hands of politicians, right? Somebody wants to reflect on that. I can make a start. I'm sure there's there's a lot to be said about that. Thank you. Um, I uh, Well, we've been trying to promote the book to a certain extent uh, among all kinds of um, people. Uh, I think that, of course, it, it calls for or it calls to <laughs> a certain group of people that is likely also to to read it or to agree to, to at least some extent. Um, so it's worthwhile. We should consider what platforms we might be able to engage with. Um, I'm based in Portugal and I've been trying to, you know, um, in encourage this topic at least. Um, among different uh, groups as well. And I think that's important, but at the same time, I feel like uh, politics and politicians are not the only actors that we should be kind of pushing. And I do think that um, the book having kind of uh, both the chapters and also um, a manifesto, which is just two pages, two pages, three pages, anyway, um, 
And then a glossary at the end. Uh, the idea is also to uh, be able to speak to students that may later become politicians, for example. Try to alter the um, the vocabulary that we even use to be able to, to get there. Um, so that's one side. And on the other side, and I think that relates to several points that have been raised, I think um, we're increasingly realizing uh, as human beings all over the world, uh, and Europe is a very, very small part of that, um, that we as humans can do a lot of things that are very different from what we have right now, and we can do it now. <laughs> we, Of course, there are systemic things that we uh, cannot change, but I think there were great suggestions about, you know, connect with the people that you know, that agree with you, that think similarly, and act in a small way for yourself, and do push, push for change among people that don't agree with you. I think there's... Um, uh, a chapter here uh, that I co-authored with, with Antonio, who's the editor that's not here, um, on mobility uh, topics, but actually it's, um, in a way it proposes uh, applying clumsy solutions, and I think there the clumsy really kind of just indicates it, it draws on uh, ideas from Jane Jacobs uh, saying that imperfection is actually a good thing uh, and on uh, Dame Mary Douglas, <laughs> if anyone knows that, her work uh, on, on clumsy solutions. So we didn't make up the word, but the idea there is that you actually have uh, different worldviews among people and you're not just going to erase the ones you don't like. That's not how it works. Um, so if we acknowledge that, then how can we create solutions that are imperfect for each one of them, but that address the issues of each to an acceptable extent in, in each step that you take? And then, of course, you still, I think, uh, if you are convinced of something, and we here, I think most of us at least, are convinced that sustainability and, uh, you know, more just housing and, and general situ situation is needed, then we should, of course, push for that to be, you know, really implemented. So I'm not calling for, you know, just do it in your little circle. But at the same time, I think start there and acknowledge that other people might not agree 100% with you, but they might agree on little things and use that. Um, and that can go for politicians or anyone else. <laughs> yeah. Just to add on to this, um, and I think Buitenhof would be a great idea to go there, but um, one point I would also stress is that um, politics goes beyond party politics. And in terms of the housing crisis, I've been talking to politicians at the local level, at the national level, for many years now, and nothing ever changed, until the housing protests by Melissa uh, took to the streets, and then suddenly the message uh, uh, was received by these politicians, but by the same people in many cases. Um, so I do think organizing from below is also a very good way to force party politics, uh, or to encourage party politics, to phrase it more positively, um, to take a step in your direction. That's, I think, a very um, important point. Another point I wanted to make is beyond Beitov and um, mainstream media, if I can still call it like that. Um, I do think it's important to develop also um, spaces for progressive intellectual debate. And this can be through books like these. I'm also very happy, for example, with the establishment of um, the Dutch version of uh, Jacobin, the magazine. So because I subscribe to it, I'm not, I don't have stakes in any way in it. But, um, I do think it's very important as well to have like this fundamental intellectual debate um, with progressive um, ideals, that there's spaces for this. And I think books like these and uh, the university in general should, um, should be the place to do so. It isn't always, but it should, it should be at least. Can I? Sorry, but this question came twice. How do we get there, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to say, I'm asked that question several times. My answer is, there are two keywords. Is Performance and pressure. So you need to perform the growth, of course. Uh, try to reduce if you can. But it's not up, up to you. It's not all about individuals. Pressure is what comes later or after or before even. It's pressuring collectively governments to undertake policies that take from excess. And the movements that are out there now, which are both environmental and justice movement, 
like the housing movement, it can be also an environmental movement because we can't produce housing forever. Uh, uh, and environmental movements are also, you know, equality movements uh, for different social groups. These movements together can pressure government to undertake a politics of limits, in fact, taxing everything that is overshooting, everything that is too much. I mean, Shell made 29 billion profit uh, last year. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, 29 billion profits. And, uh, you know, BP the same. This, this is successful. Uh, you know, there is this philosophy um, uh, stream called limitarianism of a colleague in, in Utrecht, uh, uh, Ingrid Robbins. And they asked people, what do you think is excess wealth? They said 2.2 million euros. It's extremely low, by the way, if you take the overall wealth. So the population of the Netherlands, at least a, a sample of it, thinks that only more than 2.2 million euros is excessful, is excessive. So if this is what people imagine as excessive, then we have a case to say, look, there is a huge excess there. It's not ethical anymore today to have such an accumulation because we're living in a, in a planet with limits that are coming back to us under the form of pandemics and, and, and floodings and stuff. So why not tackling that? Um, so I'm looking um, at the time we have, uh, again, Rodliva, I'd like to give somebody else the floor. Yes, over here. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation and thank you for your reflection so far. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned Shell because uh, Cody just mentioned that universities should be the place where you can reflect on this. Um, I would like your reflections on the recent occupation uh, and the way that was dealt with by uh, the CVB calling uh, the MA to uh, evict the occupation within the same day and also the ties that the University of Amsterdam has with Shell uh, in terms of... Um, internships and research projects and that kind of stuff. Thank you. All right. Um, maybe we take another question that if somebody has a question that relates to that, we can bundle because we do have a lot of questions. Um, somebody has a question that, that relates to it? Gaat liever? Right. Um, so, so very briefly, um, as a hopeful note, um, I've personally been involved in organizing a series of ateliers called Possible Futures of Europe recently, where my strong final conclusion uh, after half a year of doing this was there is a fantastic amount of energy out there uh, with a lot of very good people, also in these so-called uh, more leisured classes, who are in a state of confusion now about how things are moving and also willing to move, and not only in terms of greenwashing. So I actually think this is the moment. Um, and there's probably more people than just the, the, the frontline fighters in, in all of this. There's actually a lot of opportunity because of the levels of uncertainty. Uh, and there, there are people who are willing to reconsider, re but what they, what they might need is these spaces that you're talking about where quietly and without finger pointing and, and simplistic polarization, people get together. Uh, and, and if you can organize that, there's a lot to capture, I feel, out there. I mean, our own country, but also, uh, you know, worldwide. Right, so treat politicians as, as humans as well. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm getting here. Uh, well. <laughs> um, you want to reflect more? Briefly on the university, yeah, of course. Uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, the university that calls the police uh, to act aggressively towards its own students, I mean, that sounds crazy enough, right? Um, yes, they occupied uh, a space which was, by the way, not a lecture space, stuff used daily from us teachers, so it was not disrupting any type of university activity, so um, not even, you know, talking to them, uh, they went quickly on the, on the removal, so for, if I was there, I would be critical on that, I mean, I, I'm critical of this behavior, yes. Um, in Barcelona, students did the same. They were not kicked out, uh, uh, and not immediately, and not with police. They actually came up with a conclusion that uh, every student that enrolled in the University of Barcelona should have a course about the climate crisis. Yeah, mandatory. 
I mean, this seems to be a more constructive solution. Um, but yeah, that's the comment. And yes, if about the, the prefiguration, so imagining a different society, yeah, there is a lot out there. That's a good thing. There is a lot. There is a lot of creativity. We can make it. We are smart in a good sense as humans. Um, however, uh, uh, this solution will get nowhere without the pressure. So without the movements, without the square, and without, the, in fact, the, the, the collective action that uh, brings these ideas to the, uh, to the politics and to the mainstream political arenas. That's my view. Yeah, just to, to add a bit to that, I first of all, I agree completely on the protests. So <laughs> uh, investing in fossil fuels is bad, period, for me. Uh, <laughs> um, but in terms of um, also this, this imagine, imagination and what imagining what we can do, I think it's also very worthwhile to look into history. Uh, that's something I've been learning more. I, I also don't come from a history background, but I've really been seeing, I've been reading, I've been talking to people, but I've also, um, and I, I was just talking to Federico earlier about it, but I, um, I'm, I found very inspiring the book, The Dawn of Everything. I don't know how many of you know it, uh, by David Graeber and David Wengro. Um, it came out in 2021. And... It's, uh, it's also really like what I drew from it, and there's many lessons to draw from it, but one, one key one is that people have always been as creative as we are now. There isn't a linear path in which now we are, uh, you know, uh, as creative as it gets, and before we were just slightly less creative and slightly less interesting, basically, and we just kind of develop forward. But instead we have always experimented with a lot of different things. And if you look back in history at what humans have been capable and have been willing and, you know, have tried out to do, uh, it's, it's incredible. And I think we also can really, instead of focusing always on innovating, which I've also written about critically, but also just from the perspective of, okay, it doesn't have to be something never thought of, uh, never imagined. It can also be something that has been done, but was discarded for some reason that in that context, in that moment, it didn't work. Okay. So there must have been a flaw, but that doesn't mean it it can't have a, you know, a part that works and a part that's true. Um, so I would really encourage people to also consider that historical part um, when you're looking for inspiration, at least. Right, and also on the myth that capitalism is a prerequisite for innovation, right? An important one, or creativity. Um, yes. Hey, um, thank you for the presentation. It's super interesting. Um, I really agree with your points about looking for people who share something in common, if not necessarily everything you're in agreement, but um, this path to political power of bu building broad-based coalitions and not alienating the people that we need to persuade, because that's how we bring the pressure to the politicians and that political power. Um, I'd be really interested in, in all of your reflections on this idea of political fragmentation, and because I feel like in planning in particular, this is something that comes up in that um, I feel like people often invoke Jane Jacobs, for instance, in this quest to bring uh, decisions back down to the people and through processes like participatory democracy. But I mean, political science has also demonstrated quite strongly that in the case where we're in a system of growing inequality that suppresses political involvement, like people, when they're struggling to feed themselves and put a roof over their head and get to and from work, then they have less and less time and energy to put into politics. So I'd be interested in like, I feel like it comes up a lot in planning in particular, this idea that we should give more power to local governments, we should give more power to communities to participate in decisions. Um, I think there's a tension there that I think is often not acknowledged, and I do think that the degrowth movement or post-growth like, also tends to push this as a solution often, involving people more in decision-making, so I'd be interested in your reflections on that. Good question. Um... Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess going to, you know, encouraging getting people to do uh, stuff, right? I think people that are already over over carried with a lot of things are precisely the people that are often the ones left out. Um, and that then, that, you know, the voices of, 
of those that need to be heard are the ones that aren't heard and those that are being heard because they're able to talk in these participatory um, events and, and so on, they they then get heard and that gets perpetuated. I think that's, you know, it's, it's also a topic I've worked on in other contexts and I think it's, it's really important to realize that there is a part that it's true you can't, um, and I think, <laughs> Maybe that's related to this event. It's like a moment in time in which you're supposed to now make a different choice or a, a make, a, a, you know, there's a participatory event in which you're supposed to help planners of a city make a decision. And then in that moment, you can give feedback and the rest you can't because, you know, you don't have access to that person and so on. But I think that um, degrowth and, and also the things we've been talking about are not necessarily about a person that has a busy schedule for whatever reason, um, is, is supposed to take more time out of that and give it to this, which would be great if they can, yes, do it. Otherwise, um, also just, uh, I think there are different triggers that we can use as those people that I think are most likely perhaps to have a bit of that time to, to trigger people that are not in that position to make daily choices that are different. So precisely in the way that those things that they do do are uh, organized, try to facilitate that they are, can be done in a different way. Um, and then that can, I think, create um, chain reactions. I think that's really important to... to um, and of course, yeah, to live other realities as well, I think, to put yourself in those shoes uh, once in a while. Instead of, like, for example, I think one thing I've, I've discussed often with, uh, with Antonio, actually the other editor, is that it's, um, it's incredible how much planning is seen as, as a desk job. Uh, at, at least from the outside, I think it's less so when you are in that world. Um, but it's, it's, you could envision a planning in which the planner, who is paid to be a planner, actually has to go and be with the people that they're planning for. And I think that's much more like then you are accessible to discuss in, in, in other moments in life as well uh, when it happens to be good for you as a citizen and not when it is the government saying that's now the moment. Um, maybe I can also give... So yeah, the, the, the scale issue, so not only the participatory issue, but also the scale issue is essential. So here, my answer is maybe simplistic, but I think it's, it comes across. So there are two things we need to take into consideration. One is the downscaling of the current economy. And to do that, we don't need to ask to a small group of people to say, okay, where do you cut your flights or where do you cut your living room or stuff like this? No, we need a strong capping, so regulations that decrease the environmental impact of the most unless unnecessary activities. And this is the case of aviation, the case of energy, the case of farming, the case of uh, large infrastructures. This is stuff that you don't discuss with people in the neighborhood. However, the degrowth story, it's also about essential needs. It's about organizing a, a resilient system for essential needs. And there comes the small scale, and that comes the commons and the commoning of stuff. Because there we know that uh, people can organize their essential needs, their daily needs, in a way that is very effective for their own needs at the scale that is m micro, that is smaller. There are studies that show that the good scale, the scale where you actually have a good balance between the provision of essential needs and the access to politics, to participation, is about 16 to 20,000 people. This is a number that actually comes from very back time of the study of cities. And they say that more or less an area that about 20,000 people is an area that can be governed with a form of participation that is democratic and inclusive and it's also an air, an, a scale where you can achieve participation but of course participation without money doesn't exist okay resources are essential too but i think if we this delocalize essential services like also distributed energy systems proximity healthcare 
these are essential services, uh, some food distribution system, to that scale, we could have uh, a city that functioned pretty well and it's more accessible to, to citizens, I think. Yes, one second. No, I think if we want to, if, if you want to take residents serious, um, of course it's uh, important to involve more. But I think it's also uh, the low-hanging fruit would be to start taking seriously the ones that are already trying to involve themselves on a daily basis. And that may seem like an obvious point, but that's not my experience in general. Look at all these people that are protesting against their houses being demolished, for example, or the squatter movement, for example, did, or students that are protesting because I do think those spaces uh, should be allowed to continue while ties with shell being cut. Um, you see that those people that want to involve themselves can typically um, expect a hostile reaction, and that would seem like the obvious beginning point. So I think th that would be an obvious but often uh, forgotten element. Um, I have a question here and at the very back. There was a long time already. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, for, uh, Federico. Um, so there's at least one politician in the room today, so I can at least uh, take your ideas forward here in Amsterdam. And thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I'm looking forward to reading your book. So I'm, I'm here on the council in Amsterdam, and I had a question because in your presentation, I, of course, recognized a lot of the things that you were talking about. But one thing I was missing is our economic policy, because we talk a lot about economics, but then the whole circular economy, to my frustration, is seen as something for sustainability, while economics is nothing, just market economics. And so I was wondering if in your research or in the book, I can read it later, but uh, if you've looked at any, um, anything of our economic policy. And maybe the second question is, I think, where we often get stuck, in my experience, is sort of how our whole financial budgeting works and how we're so dependent on all these foreign investors and especially with our land policy that we just seems to be everything is dependent on every fund and I don't I still don't understand the budget after being on the council for a number of years um so if you have any solutions for that I'd be happy to hear that environmental damage will have are not as catastrophic as some of these policies make it out to be. Um, I'm not saying I disagree, it's just the economic argument, as she was saying, also has to be made to convince some of the people involved in the conversation. So how would you frame that? All right. Um. So on the economics, so you, you, so you, your point is on the persuading of like the economic reasoning behind these arguments, <coughs> persuading from an economic point of view, right? And then on the finance, the, the economics and the financial uh, aspects of the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the book, you will not find the answer to these two questions, but still recommend to get it. Uh, <laughs> uh, just to. <laughs> So uh, the second question is about the, you know, the Verevings Fund, the, 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 the offset fund. You know, the city of Amsterdam owns land. It's a great capital asset for the city. They generate revenues. With those revenues, they pay for uh, green, um, uh, public space, uh, social housing as well, because they can give a discount to housing corporations. So this is one of the arguments that comes immediately. Like, we need growth in order to make that fund growing. But um, my argument would be, uh, uh, start making a policy which is about wealth, uh, uh, about well-being, uh, care, uh, housing for everybody. Uh, make that a priority. And then you will cut on the spendings that do not fit that priority, which are equally expensive for the, reserve, for the funding of the Verenings Fund. Um, Projects like the South Axis they used a lot of that funding. Project like, uh, um, uh, the, project, you know, project like the Haven and Stad area, they use a lot of that funding uh, because they promote, they invest basically in the growth with the expectation that that money will come back and then will be used. But what the problem is with this thinking is that then we get cases like Eiburg uh, in 2008, where you know, houses were not built because the crisis hit, or over Amstel, another area in the city. 
where, where basically the economy blocks this process, the investments are made, the returns are not coming back. So in my view, it would be like to have a policy of priorities. And in the Omhevin visit, there are some indications, but still it's too, too inclusive of too many things. But you know, the Hesson, the Stad, all this aspect, that should be, be given financial priority. Um, so about the economics, I don't know what you mean. I'm not an economist, fortunately for me. Um, but um, uh, I, th I think we're talking about economics, we're talking about well-being, we're talking about space. Uh, this is economics, this is the management of resources like land. Um, so I think the point would be, let's make a strategy that brings well-being to the city. We'll make the city more attractive. Yes, because people want to live well, they will come to Amsterdam. Yes, for sure. Um, so let's make it a clear statement. Um, and be ambitious about it, and then I think investors will come. By the way, uh, uh, the elder man, uh, uh, Lenin van, uh, the pronunciation, Danzig, sorry, um, he said it clearly in his recent statement. He said, yeah, Amsterdam is uh, attractive for investors. So I don't see a problem there, actually. <laughs> I don't see no problem. I don't see investors running away if we would m invest in well-being in that sense. But that's my opinion. Thanks. Yeah, um, thanks for those points. I think for me, one thing that's um, worthwhile to talk to both economists and non-economists, people that are convinced about growth, is um, to ask them to remember, okay, so um, do you remember that growth is a means and not an end? And if you agree with that, then what is the end? What are you trying to achieve with that growth? And then if you actually understand what those people mean by, you know, what, what is the growth supposed to lead to, then question that. Question whether we want that end. <laughs> and uh, is it, it, because I think a lot of people will say, but what do you mean? <laughs> growth is, is, is good, right? Growth is, is equal to well-being. But I think there... Uh, there's really a gap. Like, what? Why? Why is growth equal to well-being? Um, in in what way? Uh, so, and try to bring back the public interest, which I think was the original goal of, you know, when when people started to talk about growth is needed, they were talking about um, reaching well-being for everyone <laughs> through growth because and uh, that appears in another paper I wrote which which was real fun to write because um, you could see that actually um, it, it, it's like growth is the only way you can justify inequality nowadays where the object the the, the alternatives previously were uh, either extraction or you know uh, you know, basically colonial uh, living, because if you want to make your well-being in the standards that we have now possible, you either have to take away from others, or you you have to yeah grow. <laughs> so so you have to make everything just go up and up, and then poor people will also, yeah. and the other alternative is redistribution, but no, you can't talk about that. So let's talk about growth, because that's the only justifiable way that we can, we can keep going. But yeah, I think that's something you can really discuss with people that are into growth. <laughs> if. Just quickly, I won't start. I won't go into land politics because then we'll have an all evening to uh, to cover. Um, but I do think the point you raised is a crucial one. Like, how do you convince the people that are more about the economics? And I don't, I don't know if they would be convinced by these arguments so far. So I do think one, you have to um, provide them an alternative where you do think where you can both agree growth in this domain is good, and Federico in his introduction pointed out several domains where you could still grow and. This is something you could or should direct them to us and also make visible the costs that are often not accounted for. And I, again, when I return to my expertise of housing, um, solving homelessness, for example, people might say that this is very expensive to solve homelessness. Giving all these people houses at subsidized rents, it's going to cost us a lot of money. But then if you actually look at the costs of people having to stay on the streets, 
people might call the police on them simply because they exist on the streets or they develop healthcare issues whatsoever. These are all very expensive things and the costs of homelessness estimates range from about 30,000 euros per year per homeless person um, to 100,000 euros per year per homeless person. You can, you can rent quite a nice apartment for these, uh, for these figures in Amsterdam still, even in Amsterdam. Um, you, have to, you have to make um, these kind of calculations. You have to convince people these are also... Um, you should make them internalize them in their calculations. And then I do think in the end um, it's an uh, affordable exercise and it's actually a cost-saving exercise. So I think... It's, it's crucial to think about this question you raised, I think, and I think there's a couple of ways out and a couple of um, ways forward. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm looking at the clock because we are a bit at the where we want to end, um, <laughs> which is uh, 6.30. So I think we'll have to close it here. Um, I feel we had, a, thanks a lot for all your engagement and all your questions. Um, I prepared a bunch of questions and I hadn't, didn't have to ask any of them because you did that for me, which is great. Um, so thanks again a lot for, for coming. Thank you for coming. Uh, I believe we have some after drinks uh, for those who want to uh, stay with us, please do. Um, and again, there's a QR code at the desk um, to get the book if you, if you want. Thanks again. Thank you.